Hey Swifties, welcome back to my channel. I am the Taylor Swiftologist and today we're going to be discussing the rise and fall of Taylor Swift as the girl boss. The reason why I want to chat about this with you today is because I think that Taylor is an excellent example of why celebrities shouldn't become political in the face of public pressure. In hindsight, her girl bossification was kind of a mistake. Did it help or hurt her career? Let's look at the historical evidence and make our assessment. To understand Taylor's trajectory towards becoming a girl boss, we have to kind of go back to where it all started. She's always been very media savvy and a chameleon of sorts. Many people forget that Taylor Swift is not an authentic country artist. She grew up as a coastal elite in Pennsylvania, with a very waspy, um, well-to-do family of bankers. So this background isn't really conducive to becoming a country music star, which has, you know, historically been more about blue-collar workers and Heartland America, a scene in which Taylor has almost no experience, at least until she moved to Nashville at the behest of her parents to become a star. I shouldn't say at the behest of her parents, because Taylor made that decision collaboratively with Andrea and Scott to move to Nashville and try and see if she could get a lucky break. And boy, did she succeed. It was a very smart move to go and pursue country music because Taylor was not risque or scandalous enough really to succeed in the pop realm at that time. However, there was an opening for a young girl storytelling in country music. It kind of hadn't been done before and Taylor very smartly and expertly identified this gap and filled it. Her country accent, in my opinion, was nearly entirely fabricated and it was completely put on to help sell records and fit into the scene that she was trying to kind of strong arm her way into when she arrived in Nashville. I wrote it about this guy that I was dating who was about to go off to college and I knew we were going to break up. So I started thinking about all the things I knew would remind him of me. And, um, you know, one of the first things that came to mind was Tim McGraw. And notice how she was able to turn it on and off depending on the circumstance. And Taylor Hansen has an amazing voice and also, you know, we're both named Taylor. And you both have great hair. Thank you. you! You share the blondness. Thank you so much. So as she starts to go more towards pop music, which I really think was her plan all along, given that her songs are pop songs at the very core of their melodic structure, um, the country twang slowly starts to disappear. And this is an early or a foundational example of how she, you know, picks her moments and she can hop on a trend or, and she can ditch that trend just as quickly in order to stay relevant and maintain some level of success. Actually, I think that her savviness and her general chameleon-like behavior is one of her most impressive skills. It has really helped her to stay relevant, but it has also gotten her in trouble. So from Fearless all the way up until Red, um, Taylor leaned heavily into this thing that I like to call the good girl shtick. And this is her form of, I'm not like the other girls. She took pains to separate herself from her contemporaries. She also used that contrast between the bad girls and her, the good girl, as a marketing tool to make her more hyper family friendly. So kind of like how she fit that young singer songwriter gap in the country music market, she also filled that in the larger public stage when people were looking for a girl pop star or a female role model to look up to. At the time when she came up in 2006 and 2007, a lot of pop stars were very infamously going through breakdowns at that time. So we're thinking Britney Spears and Amy Winehouse and you know, people who who, um, at least in Britney Spears' case, were once America's sweethearts that had kind of had a fall from grace. Um, and Taylor really leaned heavily into that America sweetheart thing and was determined to avoid the fall from grace. And I think that that idea of being notoriously pushed to your breaking point in front of the world really terrified Taylor and was kind of a driving uh, motivation for her because she resolved never to let her facade of poised perfection slip. And she went many years successfully doing this, I might add. But this is a heavy, high pressure to put on yourself at a very young age, especially when you're a young woman growing up and maturing in the public eye, trying to make mistakes. It must have been very difficult to balance this idea of perfection when you're also an artist because artists need to have life experiences and make mistakes and be messy and make stupid decisions in order to you know yield some good material for their work so straddling that balance for taylor must have been very anxiety inducing so here's a quote from a profile by the new yorker who she has never granted an interview to ever again since they ran this story uh probably because i think it was a little more revealing than she would have liked it to be it was definitely a curtain up moment uh around the speak now tour which was a time when she wasn't really ready to be kind of revealed to the world that the good girl thing was an act. It definitely punctured the veil around that persona and it revealed her as someone who was quite calculated. Um, and this is a word that would go on to haunt her for the rest of her career. So here's the quote from the New Yorker. 
In a world of low hands and wine houses, Swift is often cited as a role model, a designation she takes seriously. It's a compliment on your character, she says. It's based on the decisions that you make in your life. I don't feel completely overcome by the relentless desire to put out a dark and sexy I'm grown up now album. She recalled an incident from seventh grade. At the beginning of the year, we were all sleeping over at somebody's house and she broke into a mock whisper. They were all talking about how they wanted to sneak over to this guy's house because this guy had beer. And I was just like, she affected a panicked voice. I want to call my mom. I want to call my mom. She tells me, my whole life, I've never felt comfortable just being edgy like that. She's made many other references like this before and after the New Yorker piece that kind of reinforce this, I'm not like the other girls, I'm a good girl, praise me, cherish me, I just want to be acceptable and lovable in your eyes. But you know, there's an issue with this good girl thing that she tried to keep up for such a long time. And the issue is that there's a tone of condescension that comes along with all of these comments. There's an inference made that she is somehow better than all of these fallen women who were not able to keep it together in the public eye and and let fame break them and get to them in a way that was unappealing or undesirable in Taylor's eyes. And I think that this is her Achilles heel in general. She's a very morally righteous person and she views the world in black and white terms. And if you and your actions don't fall into her black and white view of how the world is supposed to operate, you may be on the receiving end of some wrath or intense judgment from her. This has definitely eased as she's gotten older, but it was quite ferocious when she was young. And I think that it was definitely an aggression almost that was disguised as a passive aggression. But when I look back on it, and I see the comments and I read the interviews, I'm like, wow, she was really peddling this stuff and she was really putting down other women to kind of get further. This is definitely part of what makes her so compelling as an artist as well. She's convicted and firm when she feels wrong. And we see this in her songs. Like when she's writing a song about someone who's upset her, they tend to be her biggest hits or her most talked about musical moments. It's a lesson that she's learned in life, which is to um, take your personal tragedy and make it into something that other people can appreciate and view as a public sport. But in real life, people don't fit into black and white boxes. There are often huge gray areas that most people inhabit and live within. This version of reality where not everything is easily right or wrong is very upsetting to her morally. Um, she really likes to self-evaluate all the time and try and be aware and analytical of what's going on, but most people don't live their lives like that. Um, probably because most of us don't live our lives under a microscope. She has a very different approach to what it means to be a human being in this world, given that almost every decision she makes is up for public scrutiny. For an example of how um, Taylor's view of the world being black and white kind of lets her down, I would say that, you know, when we talk about Britney Spears and Amy Winehouse, these girls that she's taking pains to distance herself from, they had turbulent upbringings and personal demons like substance abuse issues and other kind of terrible things that Taylor hasn't had to contend with on the same level. She came from an enormously privileged background and whether or not her family had food on the table did not rely on her success. Her stardom always had agency. She was always the one driving the ship and flying the plane. I don't think other celebrities like Britney Spears or child stars can really say the same. And um, for Taylor to kind of come on her high horse and you know separate herself from that and judge others because of that, which she did for a long time, I think that that is not a good look. So when you take into account kind of what the circumstances were for Britney Spears, Amy Winehouse, Lindsay Lohan, you feel some sympathy and some empathy for them. Um, but this nuanced and balanced view of events where you take into consideration external factors that aren't just about the choices that you make, um, doesn't jive with Taylor's expectations of how the world should be and how other people should behave. So for an example, let's take a comment that she made in an interview with Rolling Stone in 2012 about her exes being upset that she writes songs about them. She says, in every one of my relationships, I've been good and fair. What happens after they take that for granted is not my problem. Chances are, if they're being written about in a way they don't like, it's because they hurt me really badly. I don't think it's mean to write songs. I think it's mean to hurt someone in a relationship. In this instance, she's describing this kind of very vindictive eye for an eye morality. Because someone hurt her, she feels that she's totally entitled to hurt them back publicly and with no shame. And I think that's definitely true. It's true that if someone takes a shot at you, you're well within your rights to take a shot back. But that doesn't mean that the shot that you find back isn't uh, also hurtful or also wrong or maybe not the right call to have made in that moment. Two things can be true at the same time. She can be hurt and she can hurt someone else. Um, but for Taylor, if she gets her feelings hurt, whatever she does in response is completely justified and not wrong. She retains the moral high ground no matter what response she takes because she was hurt in the first place. I think people had a lot more leniency for this line of thinking while she was younger and they viewed her as um, a non-serious artist. But uh, during the Red Era, this way of thinking really collapsed for her. And for the first time, she received an overwhelming amount of negative responses. Um, which almost competed with the positive response that she got from making one of the best albums of her career. 
And it started when she dated Harry Styles. Um, the public fixation on her dating life and her relationships became a sport. And to be fair, it was kind of self-initiated. Um, Taylor had really encouraged her fans to connect the dots with things like the liner notes in her albums and other different Easter eggs that she would drop here and there. She encouraged us to get involved. And I suppose that once that went into the wrong hands, it kind of spiraled out of control and she didn't like it. And it was definitely a marketing ploy. But when that strategy turned against her, she found this very hard to deal with. And her usual line of defense just no longer worked. People weren't automatically sympathetic to her when she felt like she was wronged. And she was often viewed as the aggressor instead of the victim, which Again, as we know, her persecution complex continues to drive her to this day and is something that she absolutely needs to contend with. But at this point, she was still trying to find a way to paint herself in that victim role. And I don't mean that in a way to say that she hasn't been hurt or that she hasn't been wronged. I just mean to say that she has a persecution complex. She really does think that it's her against the world and that people are out to get her and that everybody has ulterior motives. Um, she's gotten jaded by experiences that she's had. So after this happened during the red era, she kind of went searching for a PR line to do some image rehab because simply saying I was hurt and upset and I deserve to be wasn't working for her anymore and it wasn't doing her any favors or winning her new fans. And this is when she discovers feminism. Keep in mind, prior to her accepting feminism as a theory, she had gone out of her way not to be political. Uh, this week was was uh, the American election, and we have two Americans here. Yeah. And you've been very secretive about uh, how you vote, what you're voting for. Well, I mean, I just figure I'm a 22-year-old singer, and, you know, I don't know if people really want to hear my political views. I think they just kind of want to hear me sing songs about breakups and feelings. <laughs> <laughs> And in many ways, she outwardly expressed her internalized misogyny. Also, remember when Tina Fey and Amy Poehler made a very harmless joke about her dating life and she said that there was a special place in hell for them? <laughs> She's been a little aggressive from time to time. She wasn't really a girl's girl prior to her feminist awakening, but when she moved to New York and decided she wasn't gonna date people for a while, the girl boss and the girl squad jumped out. But her politics have always been a little bit murky. Did you know that George Bush attended the Mine music video premiere in 2010? I don't believe that she was a Republican per se, nor do I care whether she's a Republican or a Democrat in general. Um, but I do think in the beginning she had some Christian values, let's say, socially liberal, fiscally conservative vibes. So she starts banging the feminist drum when she moves to New York City, and this is when the girl boss final form started to take shape. Taylor is hyper articulate on one subject and one subject only, and that subject is herself. She is the most self-aware person in the world. Her ability to analyze her past mistakes and metabolize what other people say about her is brilliant, but I would say that that awareness is pretty much limited to just herself. When you push her out of her comfort zone and ask her to account for, explain, or analyze things that happen to other people, she has a hard time. When she started talking about feminism, she had some valid points to make because she could find things that related to her or made sense to her life. For example, when she pointed out that male songwriters don't receive the same amount of abuse that she does for writing about love. Say, oh, you know, like she just writes songs about her ex-boyfriends, and I think, frankly, that's a very sexy this angle to take. No one says that about Ed Sheeran. No yeah, one says right. it about Bruno Mars. They're all writing songs about their exes, their current girlfriends, their love life, and no one raises a red flag there. Or when she said that it was creepy for the press to focus on a 23-year-old's dating life. That was invasive and awful. So true. Go off, queen. But that's kind of where her feminism stopped. As I said before, Taylor is very Taylor-centric. If the issue doesn't directly affect her, she struggles to see it and understand it. I mean, where do we start with her many tone-deaf accusations? It's not like these things are completely in the past, either. She's still throwing kind of strange tantrums to this day. The Nicki Minaj beef was a good example of her missing the point entirely. And more recently, her tweet uh, kind of targeting the showrunners of Ginny and Georgia in Netflix was kind of a Streisand effect. Nobody was really talking about that comment that they made about Taylor Swift offhandedly until Taylor Swift tweeted about it and made it a big deal. And no one likes to see a celebrity punching down. Creators of a show don't have the same kind of fan base that you do. Pick on someone your own size. This is why I want her to stay out of politics and social media activism in general. More often than not, she puts her foot in her mouth when she's trying to raise awareness about something. Her general ignorance towards issues that don't affect her became more apparent on social media as the hive became more focused on woke discourse. Um, and Taylor was an easy, easy target for cancellation. She was a white, rich, wealthy woman who, in 2016, when the world was kind of taking a different turn, refused to state her political affiliations. She was a sitting duck. 
And people aren't dumb. They could see that she was using the girl squad and her beef with Kanye and Kim as a way to further her own interests. PR manipulations became much clearer when social media got involved and other people could have a say. Anyway, in some respects, that cancellation was actually a good thing for Taylor. It forced her to reassess her relationship with social media. I'm very glad that she's taken a step back and doesn't post everything about her life anymore. I think it should only be an avenue for her to share her work and fun moments with the fans. And I do believe that she's been more filtered ever since she took a step back, but she wasn't done. She wasn't done when she got canceled. With the Lover album, she tried to lean into the wokeness conversation even further uh, by making the initial part of the campaign a glad advertisement. And it came off as really hollow and insincere. And it probably was to an extent. Listen, do I think that Taylor cares about gay people and wants them to have all the rights and happiness in the world? I genuinely absolutely do. Do I also believe that she wanted to capitalize on rainbow washing and wokeness to sell an album? Yeah, absolutely. The fundamental issue with Taylor is, again, her inability to speak articulately on a subject which doesn't affect her. So I cringed when I watched Miss Americana and I saw her coming out as a Democrat. It was low effort and banal, but to her, it felt like a paradigm shift. I think she attended that documentary to be a political rallying cry, um, but she repeatedly made these watered down and frankly, milk toast statements to support these very basic and out of date political positionings. In my opinion, wokeness is a losing game. Taylor will never fit neatly into any narrative drawn by a woke set of people. No matter what she says or does, it would just be easier for her to not play the game. And personally, I don't think that celebrities should be activists or that they should use their platforms to share a political agenda. Essentially, celebrities are our court jesters. They're there to make us feel good and provide us with a distraction from the real shit that's going on in the world and we should not look to them as the moral arbiters of the universe. They don't know what the fuck is going on. They're more out of touch than the rest of us. All right, so that's my thoughts on the rise and fall of Taylor Swift's girl bossery. Let me know your comments and your feedback below. Like, subscribe, all of that good stuff, and I will see you guys in the next video.